Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, introduction and for the invitation. So um, before starting into and delving into the, these two topics, I wanted to discuss briefly uh, something which is uh, kind of dear to my heart. So as you have seen and noticed in the last few years, let's say now five to 10 years, there's been many uh, materials databases that have become available online. And if you want to query uh, these databases, you need to learn the API uh, to query that database. So some of you probably know the Nomad API, but there is many different APIs and they kind of look different. So basically, just to take an example, if you want to query for silicon dioxide in COD, in the materials project or in Airflow, you see that the structure in which you have to phrase your request is uh, uh, very different from one database to another. And not only the query is different, but the response that you get is very different, okay? And so all the developers of these databases have gathered and have, you know, had very many different meetings. It's uh, from 2016 to 2022. And we designed a common API between all these databases, which is called Optimate. And now it is possible to query all these databases. So it's, yeah, it's published in uh, Scientific Data in 21. Uh, the specification of this API. And so now you can query all the databases with the same qu exact query and get the same form for the response, okay? So that's implemented in Nomad, for instance. You know, when you go on the web page of Nomad, you can decide whether you query using the Nomad API or if you click on it, it becomes an Optimate API. Okay, so this is just some kind of advertisement. And that's kind of important for machine learning because we want to gather as many data as possible, okay? And in fact, indeed, uh, when you look at the databases that you have there, um, so the, the amount of, uh, of data that you have for the different properties is very different. And why is it so? It's because the computational time is very different. So if I need to compute something about the structure, the chemistry, the electronic properties, that's kind of easy. If you want to go for a response function like elasticity, piezoelectricity, that requires much more time. And as a result, you will not be surprised to see that most of the data that's available in all the databases that I was showing before are about the ground state uh, properties, the structure, the chemistry, electronic properties, but not about those more evolved properties. So just to give you an example, so we are interested in looking at the stability of element. That's one of the first thing that we do about materials. And so we are able to compute the energies at zero temperature from DFT. And so we can make a convex hull plot. So this is the example of the copper oxide system when on the one end you have all the structures that are purely copper, on the other end, all the structures that are purely oxygen that you order, and then you have the in-between composition. So you can find the structures that are stable and that will not dissociate into other structure. That's the convex hulls. But that's at zero K because it's uh, ab initio DFT it would be more desirable to have the stability in temperature because we don't live at zero K, we live way higher. And so we need to take the vibrational entropy into account, okay? That's possible from our calculation using the SPT, but that's very demanding. So just to give you an example, we developed an high throughput workflow to compute the, the phonons. And so, you know, that takes a CPU time, quite a lot of that. And then we release that, so, uh, but release that for only 1,500 compounds, okay? And that was in millions of CPU hours, okay? So yeah, it's available on the materials project. The input output are also available on Nomad. The interface here is only on the materials project. Uh, but the main point that I want to make is that, you know, when we compute those advanced properties, that's only for a limited amount of data, okay? And this is where machine learning might become handy because we want to be able to do these calculations faster, use that, I mean, we want to look at the stability in temperature, okay? So uh, one of the most crucial steps that we have to do if we want to use machine learning is of course, to uh, represent the structure with numbers. So this, the features that are describing the structures. Um, we usually use two methods here. Uh, one is a math miner, and I will say a few words about that. And the other one is magnet, which is not actually a feature representation, but it's a convolutional graph network. But at the end of the process, you get also a vector of numbers, which you can use then in, um, as a description of your structure. 
So in MapMiner, which is an open library that you can use, uh, you can get features about the composition, the element fraction, the mean atomic mass, and so on, uh, about the structure, the space group, the crystal system, radial distribution function, about the site, the local site, the, the environment, if it's a tetrahedral environment, a BCC or whatever, okay? So all of that, that's a huge number of features that you can get, okay? So MegaNet, as I was mentioning, it's a convolutional graph network, okay? So there are different layers. I don't have the time to go into the details here, but what they did is that they uh, developed that and trained that on the formation energy of the materials project. So on 60, 70,000 data, let's say. And you see that they got a very nice accuracy between the predicted uh, formation energy and the actual one. I don't know which one is the, I think it's this one. And the, in any case, so based on that, then they did transfer learning and you can get the gap with a, a retraining with a smaller number of data, you can get a, a very good accuracy. But so this you can use once you have created your network, you can reuse that to as a descriptor of your structure. Now, the problem that we have with machine learning, you know, if you take the simple approach is like a random forest, for instance, you can quickly get a reasonable result, okay? So if I look at the predictive power with a few data, okay, you can get something, okay? But if you increase the amount of data, it will not improve that much, okay? If we move to neural networks, uh, then, I mean, it takes more data to get something, but then you can improve the accuracy. And if you go to these graph networks, such as the convolutional ones, you can improve further the accuracy of the model, but that requires even more data, okay? And as I was mentioning in the beginning, the, you know, the, the properties for which you would like to use machine learning to predict because the computation is long are precisely those for which we have few data. And this is why we try to develop something in which we try to use as little data as possible. So, the two things that I'm going to be speaking about today are about the quantity of the data and the quality of the data. As you know, you know when you do uh, more accurate uh, calculations, yeah, I'm going to go, go to that one later on. So if let's first speak about the quantity, okay? So in our field, are we actually dealing with big data? And here I put the, the SORAD paradox that says that, okay, you have a, a heap of, of sand and you know every time you remove one grain from the heap, it's still a heap. Okay, you can repeat that that much until a moment in which it's not a heap. So are we big data or not? I don't know, okay, but we don't have that many. Okay, so we have introduced something that we call the Material Optimal Descriptor Network, ModNet. So it's based on a feed-forward uh, neural network, and the idea is to try to obtain the optimal set of descriptors. So we try to out of all the possible descriptors that you get from that manner, for instance, then we make some smart selection of the features in such a way that you limit the number of features, the number of weights that you have in your network. And so you need less data to obtain reasonable weights on your network. So the idea is to kind of put and pose some constraints. So in, in such a way that, you know, you get the most important features, okay? So as I said, it reduced the optimization space, and so we don't need that many data. The bonus that we introduce is that we have you know, an architecture for the neural network in which it is possible to learn several properties at the same time. And I will show you the interest of that in the case that I was showing you before of the vibrational entropy as a function of temperature. So the first thing that we want is that the features that we select have some kind of interrelation with the target. So if we have a feature like this, this is not really interesting. I mean, it's not related in any way. It looks with respect to the target, it's not too useful. In contrast, if we have something like this, we really would like to take that feature as an input to the model, okay? Yeah, by the way, if there is any question, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Yeah? Okay, so one easy way to introduce this interrelation is the so-called Pearson coefficient, that you correlation coefficient that you probably know, that basically says that when you have a linear relation between X and Y, you have a perfect uh, correlation, then you have a, a Pearson coefficient, which is one. When uh, it's slightly less, then it decreases, it goes to zero when there's basically no correlation, and then you can go to the negative correlation here with, when R is minus one, okay? That sounds interesting. Uh, the problem is that if you look at this Pearson coefficient, when you have you know, scattered data like this, that's fine, it's r equal to zero. But if you take a perfect parabola, then it's also r equal to zero. 
that's annoying. Right? This is precisely a feature that you would like to take when you have something like that. Okay, so we decided to go for what is called the normalized mutual information, NMI. So what is the mutual information is uh, when you have two variable, that's the a measure of the mutual dependence of these two variables. So it's in a way how much you know about one variable if you know the other one, okay? So basically if you have these two variables X and Y, so the, uh, the amount of information that you know about X is what is represented in red, what you know about Y is what is represented in blue here, and uh, what you know about one when you know the other is the, basically the intersection. And so the way to normalize that is that you define the mutual information, so the purple part, which is the superposition of the two, and you divide it by what you know about each of them divided by two. So basically, when they're completely, when you know nothing about one variable, when you know the other one, that's zero. And when you know everything, so basically when you know one, you have everything about the other, then it's a one. Okay, so we have a measure of how much you know about one variable when you know the other one. And that's very useful because what we have introduced is that we basically rank the different features based on this. And so what we do is that uh, we, we try to get the feature that have the highest and uh, normalized mutual information with the target, okay? That's the first one that we will choose. And that's very interesting in terms of understanding the physics because basically this is just an example uh, where you give a property and then the code tells you, oh, the one that is the most relevant is this one. Then the second one is this one and so on and so forth, okay? So you have an idea of the physics and I will give you some examples of what you can get from that. So just this one first example, if we look at the vibrational entropy that I was showing to you before, so the first two features that come out is the interatomic uh, bond lens and what is called the valence range of the constituent element. And that's some kind of measure of the ionicity. So if you plot this vibrational entropy here at 305K as a function of the first uh, feature here, you see that there's a clear trend. So they're clearly interrelated. And if you think about the physics, it's clear that you know the, the longer the bond, the lower the vibrational entropy, okay? And in the same way, the stronger the bond in terms of ionicity of the bond, uh, you have a variation from, yes, yeah. uh, you have a variation from the yellow to the blue that's from here, the top to the bottom. So you see the, the second feature here is colored and you can clearly see a trend as well, okay? Same is true, but less uh, obvious in this case for the band gap, uh, sorry, for the refractive index. The first feature that comes out is the band gap and we know that there is an inverse relationship between the refractive index and the band gap from the physics. And uh, the second one that comes out is the density. So, I mean, these are two examples in which it's kind of obvious and we could have said it's from the physics, but you can you know, bring that to other examples in which we don't have an idea what the most important feature is. And that comes out of this uh, uh, first selection of the feature. So that's for selecting the first feature. So when you have the first feature, that's the one that is the most, that has the most normalized mutual, uh, the highest normalized mutual information with the target. When you choose the second one, so you want to add extra information because it's nice that it's, you know, the second one, it's nice that it's, it has a good normalized mutual information with the, the, with the target, but if it's not bringing new information compared to the second one, let's say that I have Y that is correlated strongly to X and it's strongly uh, correlated to X squared as well, obviously, I mean, I am not bringing any new information, okay? So what we want to do is that we uh, want to avoid redundancy. And so what we have defined is a relevance redundancy score. So if you have selected a number of features, so you can start from one, okay? So what you want to choose the second one is that the second one has a high ratio between its mutual information with the target divided by its mutual information with the first one because the highest the mutual information was the first one, that's something that you want to avoid. If it's basically the same information as the first one, that's not very useful, okay? And so this is how we define this uh, relevance um, redundancy ratio. So you want high relevance, but low redundancy, okay? And so we can tune the parameters P and C that you have in the formula here in such a way that we kind of balance the relevance and the redundance, okay? And so once you have selected the second one, then you would select the third one by looking at its uh, normalized mutual information with the target again, but divided by 
their uh, normalized mutual information with respect to the already selected features, okay? So this is how you slowly build the set of features, okay? And so the selection proceeds until you decide, okay, I want 300 uh, uh, features, or if you say, okay, I'm trying to get a certain level of accuracy for my model, okay? So this is how we select the feature. And so basically, um, ModNet uh, is done like this. So we start from MathMiner. So basically, you're going to provide either a CIF file or a structure. Basically, if you provide a structure or a composition, you get all the features from MathMiner. So either only those for the composition or those for the composition and the structure. So I showed you in the beginning, you know, the three kind of features that you can get from MathMiner. And that's really a lot. If you have the structure, we're speaking about 3,000 or 3,500 features. So you really need to go through this selection procedure, and then you reduce the number to, let's say, a few hundred of um, features. And once you have that, the next thing we did is that so we put a, a feed-forward neural network uh, behind. But the next feature that we entered into that is the possibility to learn different properties. So you see in this plot, you have a number of different properties here at the bottom, at the, the right, sorry. So you have a given property A that may depend on another parameter. So for instance, it could be, I don't know, the entropy as a function of temperature. So that's the example that I'm going to be looking at afterwards. Then you could have another thermodynamic property as a function of temperature. Okay, And then you could have something like a mechanical property as a function of pressure, for instance. Okay, And so you can put different properties okay, that are generated by the same material. So what the aim of that is, is that you know, one of the difficulties that we have with the neural network is to fix the weights of the, the neural network. And here, by adding something which is kind of common to all the properties, we're trying to get what is the genome of the material. So we're trying to extract what's, what is the essence. And that basically can then generate the different properties. Okay. And so we've seen that that improves, as I will show you. So coming back to the example that... Uh, um, I was giving you, so we don't want to do the DFT calculation. And so we can do machine learning. And so there has already been before us a few attempts in the past. So one was by uh, the group of Stefano Cortarolo here, where they basically computed this, this point here. So they had a given training set and they obtained a given vibrational entropy uh, prediction error. Okay. So we repeated this with a larger set where we could vary the number of elements that we have in the set. So this is the error that you get. And you see that basically we have something which is very similar. And so this is a random forest just based on the composition. Okay. So easy to, to use, uh, but you see that at some stage you saturate in terms of the uh, kind of precision that you can get. So if you go to a random forest, including the complete structure, so not only uh, the composition, but also uh, parameters, you know, explaining how the atoms are one with respect to another, uh, well, that improves, as you can see. And then we went to a different model. So we compared, so Magnet, which was this, um, a graph and the convolutional graph network. And we compared that to what we introduced, which was ModNet. And as you can see, we are doing a, a slightly better than Magnet. And then, yeah, this is a, um, a zoom on, 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 on this plot. And the important point that's here is if you don't do any feature selection, that's the orange line that you have here. So basically when you have this um, uh, very few data, you see that if you don't do feature selection, if you take all of them, you have less accuracy. Okay, whereas when you have more and more data in the end, obviously they tend to the same value. Okay, so you see that when you have a small amount of data, it's really important to do some work on the feature selection. Okay, this is why I was discussing with uh, Luca yesterday that uh, you know the, the effort that you're doing in, in this kind of feature selection can be useful, especially when we have a limited data set, which I think is often the case in material science. Okay. So the last point here is this uh, green curve, which is when you learn several properties at the same time, you see that you can have a slight improvement uh, depending on where you are in this graph here with respect to uh, the original one. So getting this common part can be interesting. And as a result of that, this is the kind of thing that, that we have. So in the solid line here are the thermodynamic properties. So you have the vibrational entropy in yellow, the enthalpy in red, the specific E in blue, and the internal energy in green. So these are computed from DFT, the solid lines. And what you get with the dashed line is the neural network, so the ModNet, that's basically predicting the different temperatures. And you see that in most of the cases, we have something which is really nice. In some cases, there's some error, 
but still, I mean, you know, you get at basically zero cost, now that you're doing the machine learning, you can get the entropy much faster, and that can be useful when you screen materials, okay? Obviously, you need to pay attention uh, to the uncertainty that you have, because uh, one of the things, so we're interested in looking again, so this is the, the copper oxide system that I was showing to you before, you have different phases here as a function of temperature. And so you can see that the order in, in which the phases are ranked one with respect to the other can change with temperature. Okay, so it's important to take that temperature into account. But as I was mentioning, we know that you know, because of the machine learning, there is some uncertainty. And so you need to be careful when you assess and before discarding some uh, candidates, just be aware that maybe there is some uh, too, much, too much uncertainty. It's better to keep them you know, while still reducing and removing some of the candidates. Okay? So um, to test ModNet, so there is a, a benchmark that is available that is called MadBench. So it consists of 13 uh, data sets that uh, with different tasks. So you have 10 regressions and three uh, classifications. Among the uh, different tasks, you have nine tasks for which you have uh, the complete structure and four tasks for which you only have the composition. And then you have different sizes of the data set. You have small sizes. You have uh, two data sets that are below 100, uh, 1,000 material, some that are between 1,000 and 10,000, some that are between 10 and 100, and then some other that are above the uh, 1,000K uh, materials. And then you have different kinds of properties. So you have stability, electronic properties, mechanical properties, optical property, thermal properties. And so you can compare the errors that the different uh, methods that have been proposed are doing. Uh, so here you have the error, the lower you are, the better. And you can see that modern which is in purple and orange here, is leading in four of those tasks and is very well ranked for uh, many of them, especially when the number of data is limited, okay? Okay, so then another thing that we introduced and we think is very important is uh, having a probab probabilistic mod nets. So because as you have seen yesterday, for instance, having the uncertainty, if you want to do a Gaussian process, active learning, it's important to have not only the prediction, but also some kind of error estimation, okay? So one way to do that is to uh, bootstrap. So you start from your original data set and then you sample with replacement. So that means that if you have an original data set of let's say a hundred samples, you pick randomly a hundred, but you know, each time you pick, you put it back so you can pick the same, uh, the same element several times, okay? So the, the, the bootstrap data set are different from the original one. Okay, and when you do that, you fit a model for each of these bootstrap and you multiply by how many you want, and then you get prediction for that. So you can get an average of all the prediction, you can get uh, a standard deviation out of that, and you can get some confidence interval. Okay, so that gives you a monet in which you also have the accuracy, the, the uncertainty, sorry. So that means that for instance here, uh, this is a, the refractive index, yeah? So for the refractive index, you see that the, the prediction that we have, we have now not only the, the value that we predict, but we also predict some kind of error, okay? And so basically uh, you see that in the region where you have the high refractive index where there is few data, the error is gonna be bigger. I mean, there's no uh, magic in the machine learning. It's just, you know, essentially some kind of interpolation, okay? Uh, the nice thing about that is that then you can um, make some kind of calibration in the sense that uh, you, you look at the range of your property and you see how many um, um, observation are in the actual sample and the data set, sorry, and how many you have predicted in the same range. And so you can see whether you are underestimated. Ideally, you would like to be, you know, that your blue curve is exactly on uh, the diagonal, but it's often some deviation either up or down, but it's this here. Uh, and so you could recalibrate. Uh... Okay, so that's for the uh, quantity of the data. Let me now move to the quality of the data, which is also something very important. And the nomad effort is something important in that range. Um, let's take the example of a student that wants to uh, prepare for the theoretical driving license, okay? So the first thing we would do, of course, is to read a book about, you know, the rules and so on. There's a question. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, it says, hi, sorry if I missed this point, but can you abroad also detect catalytic phase transitions, for example, find superconducting transitions when calculating electric resistivity? Also, is 
there a general trend that still larger data set is necessary for calculating complex systems generally more within realistic time scale to drive reliable accuracy? Okay, so it's a long question. Um, so many things there. I mean, uh, as far as I know, I mean, it's uh, not obvious to obtain. I mean, first of all, you need to, to get data so to, to do these things. So in terms of DFT calculation, uh, the DFT calculation are, are rather limited in what you can do. So of course, the machine learning is going to be limited by the data that you have. So if there are experimental data, and so in terms of superconductivity, there is this supercon uh, database that I know where there is a number of systems in which uh, you have the, um, the temperature for the transition, but it's only based on the composition. And for that, you can use that to make predictions. So this is something that uh, some students have done as a, an exercise. But in terms of the resistivity, uh, I mean, the only way that I uh, know things in ab initio that would be computing the electron phonon coupling. So this we can do. And again, we can do that only for a limited data set. So I have the impression that uh, it's kind of difficult still now. These are very demanding calculation. We can try to do something, yeah. Okay, I'm not sure that I answered the question because it was not completely clear to me. Okay, so let me move to the quality of the data. So as I was mentioning, uh, we have the student that wants to prepare for the driving a license exam. So the first thing that he does is he uh, reads the theory and he tries to study it, but then, I mean, he wants to prepare for the exam, okay? So he's gonna go on the website of the, you know, the official school where they, uh, they deliver the diploma. And so maybe they will give you some examples of uh, questions. And then you will find uh, online uh, books that you can buy, in, uh, that you can buy internet access to exercises, but you have no idea about the quality of those. Okay, they are made by people that are not the same people that are interrogating. Okay, so you have a different kind of quality of the data that you want. So what is the best strategy for the student? Should he focus only on the official and get rid of the other one? Or is there still a way to take advantage of the other one to train and to be you know, better for the official examination, okay? So that's a bit what is called, what we intend by multi-fidelity data is having uh, data and you're not completely sure about their quality. Is it good? Is it bad? You have different degrees and you want to try to exploit as many of that as possible. That's the idea. Again, because we have a limited data set, okay? So that's an example in which you have, let's say, you know, if you have high fidelity data, so you have the curve here, that is the, the one that's here, that's the ground truth, the real one. If you have high fidelity data, that would be, you know, something that is on spot respect to the curve, whereas a low fidelity might have some noise that is, you know, random noise. So there is variation respect to the value, but there can be also systematic noise. So there can be both, okay? So, you know, in material science, we have that because there is a trade-off between the cost to get something of high quality and uh, the accuracy that we get. So if we want to have low quality, we're gonna have many more data than if you do high quality, okay? So if we do, you know, we know that the band gap is underestimated by DFT. If we want to do GW, we can, but the size of the database that we have in both cases is completely different, okay? So there is this trade-off and we have to live with that. And, you know, one of the most uh, expensive uh, measure is the experimental one because often our calculations are faster than the experiments, okay? So this is really, typically you will have, and I'm gonna show you an example here. So if we look at the band gap, for instance, so uh, there are databases available. If you look at the experiment, one of the biggest that I know is like 2,700 compounds for which we have the experimental value, okay? And whereas if you look at PBE, then we can be like 50,000 of those, okay? If we go for more evolved DFT calculation, you know, like HSE, so that's the orange there, you see that there is already an order of magnitude compared to the PBE. Okay, so you see that the accuracy that we have, you know, the more accurate the data, the lower the number of data. So the idea of this multi-fidelity is we have these, okay, but we think that it's important, despite the fact that we are off, to take advantage of that to have a better result of your prediction of the experimental one. 
Okay, that's the idea. So of course, the data that you have is uh, um, you know different for the different databases. So you can have the diversity in terms of the elements. So that's what you have at the bottom. So for the different uh, elements, you have a different number for each of the data sets. Okay, and then if you look at the overlap of the data sets, so some are common to all of them. So there's only 57 here. Whereas if you look at uh, some other intersections, you have uh, some more, but you have uh, some data for which you only have the experiment, some for which you only have PB, some for which you only have HSC. So you see that getting all of that may be interesting. Okay, so you learning more by putting more data, provided you can do something with the fact that you know that it's lower quality or higher quality, so you have to deal with that, okay? Okay, then the other thing that is important to look at is that, um, the distribution of the gap in this case, but of the property in general, can be different for the quality that you have, okay? So if we look at the experiments, you see that half of the data are metals here, okay? It's not the same proportion in the other ones. So for instance, this one has a, a very tiny amount of metals, and this one has no metals, okay? This is just because the functional G here, the GLLB, was developed to you know, try to show that you are correcting for the VFT problem. So they tested it mainly on gapped material, not on metals, okay? But so you have to deal with that. You have to pay attention to the fact that there are some biases in the data sets that you have. Okay, so, I mean, we were not the first to do anything like that. Um, so first, I'm gonna show you this plot is gonna be coming several times here. So let me uh, take a bit of time to explain it. Um, so, so this is, a, first of all, at the top here, a comparison between uh, the uh, predicted band gap by, by DFT, so that's uh, no machine learning or whatsoever, compared to the true one, which is the experimental one here. So these data are only for the points that are in the intersection between P, so PBE, and the experiment, okay? And that's gonna be the results that you have here. The intersection between HSC and experiment, and that's the result that you're gonna get here, between this scanned functional and uh, experiment, and then this GLLB functional and experiment, okay? And so we can see the average error that we get, so that's the bar that you have here, so you see that PBE has a 0 0.4 something, HSC roughly the same, and these seem to be bigger, okay? So now if you look into more detail, so we split the data into uh, the metals again, the small gaps, so the ones uh, smaller than two, and those that, are, those that are wide gaps, bigger than two, you see that the error that you get for the different functional varies from uh, one to another, because some of them, as I said, were developed mainly for correcting for the gap. And so for instance, this one is quite bad for predicting metals, okay? Okay, so this is the plot, and this is the, just the DFT calculation. So the aim is to see if we can do better with it than that, with machine learning, okay, by exploiting all these data that we have. So, and uh, the error that I'm gonna be showing with machine learning are of course done by doing, um, you know, um, uh, what's it called again? You know, when you divide in five, F, you know, cross-fold validations, okay? Okay, so now in DFT, people have realized that there is some kind of trend of overestimation or underestimation, well, underestimation, most of the case, some guy, in some case, uh, underestimation. So they said, okay, let me just use the fact that I can fit a line here to rescale the data, okay? So you can just simply say, okay, I'm underestimating, let me increase the gap by a factor of something, okay? So if you use these factors here, the A and the B that you have from the slope, you can use that to change the gap. And once you do that, you get the orange bars that you have here. So you scale the data, so you do your DFT calculation, and then you, you apply a linear scaling of your data, okay? So that improves the gap also, okay? So this is something that people have used in the past. Now, um, if we use just the experimental data, so we have the machine learning uh, that is done just on the experimental data, okay? So you use only the experimental data, and we compare the results that we get to those that we had for, again, these intersections, okay? So you see that if you just learn on the experimental data, we do something which is worse than DFT, okay? See, those are the bars, the green bars that are obtained with just machine learning on the experimental data are giving a result that is worse than just DFT. 
So the people from Magnet, they came uh, with uh, an idea. So they said, okay, so we're going to provide the, as features, the uh, atomic structure as we did before. But now we're going to provide a few more features that tell the machine learning model, what is the fidelity of the data? So they can say, okay, yeah, this data, this structure, I have the value for PV. So they have an encoding of the structure plus an encoding of the quality of the data, okay? And based on the two, they have a model to predict the results, okay? When they do that, you see that there is a clear improvement. So they are able to improve. So compared to uh, just the just learning on the uh, experiment, you see that there has been you know, a significant proof, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, and that there has been also some kind of improvement compared to the DFT results. So in most of the cases now, we're at least, I mean, at least sometimes slightly better than the PB, the, the DFT results, and sometimes slightly worse or you know, better, okay? So that's a clear improvement. So it really means that using all the data, even those of low quality, provided you say, these are low quality data, it is possible to improve, okay? So we tested different approaches to try to exploit all these data. Uh, one obvious one is the so-called transfer learning. So the way we did that was you take all the data, you know, you don't care about whether that's PBE, HSE or whatsoever, you put them together and you learn on all that. So you just take the same features as before, but if you have one point for which you have the three values, you're gonna have three points in the, the, in the data set, okay? So you don't label the points, you just say, this is my results. So you consider all the things as noise, okay? And then once this gives you some weights, initial weights uh, for your network, you use these initial weights to retrain and remove the low quality data. So in this case, we remove the PBE data. And then we do the same by removing the HSC data and we just train in the end with experiment, okay? So that's taking advantage of the, the data to initialize the weights if you want. So that's the transfer learning. Another way that we did is what is called joint learning. This is very similar to what I was showing you with ModNet. It's basically you have the same network in the beginning and then it dissociates into several parts where you learn different properties, okay? So with the, the, the same uh, data, you can uh, either train on the PBE or you have both prediction at the same time, okay? Another one is called the stacking ensemble learning. So basically you uh, have a first neural network that learns on the PBE data. You have a second neural network that learns on the experimental data, a third one that learns on the HSC data. And then you take the three results and uh, you do some kind of linear regression, for instance, and you make your final prediction and your uh, linear regression is trained on just the experimental data. Okay, so basically this is, changing the descriptors that you have for each of the structure by computing a prediction for PBE, a prediction for uh, experimental, and a prediction for the HSE. And finally, we tested also a deep stacking case in which rather than combining the final result of the three networks that I've shown you before, we combine the uh, last layers of them together. And these are new descriptors that we use to train on the, um, on the experimental data. So again, we did cross-validation of everything and we compared the results. So here, uh, three parts in this comparison. So the first part as a reference, which is the experimental data. So that's the first line that you have there. So that's the zero person that you have here, okay? So we have uh, 2000 and something data for which we have the structure. Uh, just for reference, we have a bigger data set with experiment, but for which it's only the composition that is known now. Okay, if you just have the composition and you compare, so for the same elements, of course, then you see that the accuracy with just the composition is lower. Okay, so adding information about the structure is important. So now we have this transfer learning where we first learn on the union of the three data set, then on the union of HSC and the experiment, and then the experiment, and that didn't improve the, the calculation, okay? So we tried uh, a joint learning between PBE and experiment, and that was a slight improvement by 4%. Uh, sorry, yeah, a slight improvement by 4%. Yeah, sorry, for the composition, it's actually a 4% improvement. So 
because of more data, despite the fact that it's only on composition, it was better, okay? So then the deep stacking, the stacking and the deep stacking uh, did some improvement. Another thing that we tried is to use PBE as a feature. So you have the feature that describes the structure, and then you have, when you have the PBE result, you use that as a feature, okay? And when that's the case, we see that there is a slight improvement, but the best results that we obtain, and you see that it's a significant improvement, it's 17% improvement, is when uh, we did the following, is we, uh, for all the data for which we had both PBE and experiment, we learned on the difference between the two. So on the error of PBE. And so when you learn the error of PBE, so it's a smaller thing that you're trying to predict. And so you're doing a better job for that. And so basically, if you have the PBE calculation, the correction is gonna give you a better gap uh, compared to predicting right away the experimental value. Okay, next we um, did an experiment with uh, um, the sets that were common, so all the, all the data that was common to all three. And you see that we have obviously way less data. And there we uh, compare the, the single fidelity, so uh, the one based on experiment only. Again, that's the zero level. And then correction on PBE or correction on HSE. And here you see that the correction on, on HSE uh, was even better than on PBE. But Again, so that means that if you want to apply this method, you need to do an HSE calculation before correcting it with machine learning, okay? And then finally, um, this is the correction learning uh, in the case where we uh, uh, trained uh, on the experimental data for the single fidelity. So that's again, uh, just on the composition, okay? So this is just on the composition. And again, you see that there are some improvements, okay? so this. This was a test that we did. Then a few more tests, and that's for a different paper. Um, the idea here was to try to say, okay, let's try to uh, take the best method to have, first of all, a model. And to do that here, we were trying two different things. One, which is called, so both methods are um, some kind of transfer or curriculum learning. So one was what we called a one by one. So that means that we first train on one data set, then on another one, then on another one, again, using the previous one as a starting point, okay? It's, you know, as if you are at school, you are taught to learn first uh, additions before subtractions, and then you're taught to do multiplication and so on and so forth. This is why it's called curriculum. There is, you know, a given order to learn the things one after the other, okay? And here what we did is we tried all the possible paths, okay? The paths, sorry. So sequences of learning. So as if at school, you first had learned the logarithm and then the addition, okay? So we tried everything that was possible. The other option that we tried is what is called an, an onion. So basically we first train on everything, then we remove data and we train again on that. We remove data and we train again on that. We remove data and we're getting, uh, we train again on that. And again, we tested all the possible paths, okay? So all the possible sequences of learning. Okay, so what do we get? If we do the one-by-one -one training, so these are all the possibilities. So the uh, colors here, sorry. Oops, I think I moved. No. So here are the possible, all the possible, um, you know, ways to train. So the color gives you the, the method. So the green is for PBE, the yellow is for HSC, the blue is for uh, scan, GLB and starting, and the E star means starting with the experiment, okay? So then, I mean, once you've trained with the PBE, you can then train with the other ones. Then if you've done PBE and HSC, you can train with the other three and so on and so forth. And so we have all the possibilities here and we try to look at what's the best approach, okay? So we saw on average, so look at, so these are the average here, the, the bars that you have, the vertical bars here, are the average that you get for the starting with the, a given method. And so we saw that on average, starting with the GLLB provided uh, the best result in the end, okay? But you see that there are big variation there. So we thought, hmm, let's have a look at, what happens when we gather them, not by what we start, but by what we end, okay? So if we end with PBE, if we end with HSC, if we end by scan, if we end by G, or if we end by experiment. And you can see that if you end by the HSC or the experiment, 
you have a much better result. And you see that compared to the previous plot, there is way less scatter in gathering these in this way. So it's really, in the end, the last training that matters in terms of the best model that you get. Okay, so this is the training one by one. And we did the same with the onion that I was telling you before. Again, if you uh, classify that by the first, um, the first training set that you remove from the onion. So you, you know, you're peeling your onion with all the data and you remove the, the data. You see that again, there is, you know, if you remove G in the first place, that's the best, okay? But you see that again, there is this scatter. And so if you rank them by how you finish, it's a better way to see things. And the best way to see things is that if you finish by the experiment in the onion, so you start from the, all the data, okay? And then uh, you end with the experiment, that's where you get the best results. And you see that it doesn't matter that much on how you trained before, okay? So we found, however, that if you start from the, uh, by removing the low quality data, and then you continue. So, uh, you know, the words that we have in the beginning is this, I remove it, then I move to the next one, I remove the low quality and I hand with the highest quality, then that's how I get the best model, okay? So this is our starting point, is having a good model for the data. So, um, yeah, here, this is what I was mentioning to you. So basically, you have the comparison of the, the mean average error for the different methods. So starting from only experiment, then the different sequences, the best, the worst, and so on. And as I was mentioning, those that finish by the, the, by the experiment are among the, 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 the best, okay? Okay, so now we come to the uh, point that we try to, you know, to, to bring some beauty here, is uh, we have all these data, and we are going to assume that the different functionals, the different, uh, you know, quality of the data is noise. It's exactly the curve that I was showing you before. So we have the high accuracy points that basically follow the curve, the ground truth, and then we have some other curves that are maybe a shift respect to that plus some random noise, okay? And we are going to apply a denoising procedure. So it's different from what was done by uh, the group of Shui-Ping-Ong in which they added some feature to describe the fidelity. Here, we take all the data always and we denoise them. So I'm gonna show you how it works. So basically, as I was mentioning, for a given structure, you have, uh, for different structures, you have, uh, uh, a given property, so that can be the band gap. So let's say that this is the true value, so the experiment. So you always have to assume that one of the values that you have is the true value. So in our case, we always take the experiment as the true value. So experimentalists will tell us that it's not always, always perfect and there is noise in experiment. But I mean, even in experiment, you can say that uh, some data that is more recent is probably more accurate than some data that is older. So you can always kind of give some quality to your data and you have to, in some way, to label them and say, this data set is better than this one and so on and so forth, okay? So once this is done, for the different structure, you may have different values. So it could be a PBE in green, an um, scan, if I'm not wrong, in blue, and then the GLLB in, in red, okay? The idea is that we're gonna give, uh, so you get that for the different structure. For the different structure, you may get different um, values, so, so fidelity. It can be an HSE result, it can be a PBE result. In some cases, you have the HSE, but you don't have the PBE. You have the GLLB, but you have, don't have the scan, and so on and so forth. So for each of them, you have different number of data. And sometimes, you don't even have the experiment. Okay, I didn't show that here, but we only consider those for which uh, there is experiment here in this example. Okay, so the first thing we do is that we fit the model. And as I showed you, the best way to do that is to use the onion. So with all the data and remove those of low accuracy and finish with the experiment. So you have something which is already reasonable as a, um, a predictor. So once you have that, you uh, make the prediction for the different structures, okay? So these are the prediction of the model. And now we're gonna look at the different results that we had before. And we are going to define a threshold for cleaning. And we say that if we are outside that threshold, that means that there is a bias on the point. And so we are going to replace that point by the uh, value predicted, okay? Same here. So when we're outside of the range, we change it. If not, if we are in the range, we keep the data, okay? And we do that for the different ones in such a way that in the end, you have reduced the number of, well, you didn't reduce, you have, 
um, so each of the points that were outside of the range are replaced by point in the range, okay? And we can repeat that several times. So again, from the new points that we have, so those that have been denoised one time, you can again use a machine learning model. Again, it can be an onion on, based on that. And based on that, you can again uh, redo that, the predictions, and again, the uh, cleaning of the points or the threshold and then the cleaning, okay? And you can iterate that. So when we do that, you see that, so the, the top is the row results that we had in the beginning, and now the results that we have when we have denoised, okay? So you see that there has been a clear improvement, okay? And it's much faster because it's not a DFT calculation. It's, we have just a model, we enter the data and we get the result. And when we compare that to the other results, the previous results, so that I showed you before, you see that we have a further improvement compared to the magnet, okay? And in this case, we have reached the situation where the model, so the red, is better than the DFT calculation in all the cases, okay? The only exception is if you have a small gap material, okay? In that case, especially for the metals, if you have a low value, you see that the PB error here, that's the lowest that we have. So the PBE error is the lowest even compared to that. So that means that if your machine learning model predicts that it's a very low gap between 0 0.1 and 0 0.2, it might be useful to do a PBE calculation just to check whether it's a metal or not, okay? So we did, uh, so the, the, the model that you can use for doing that, uh, so we, you know, for comparison with the previous results. So if I go back here, so in order to compare to the results of Shaping Ong, uh, we used Magnet in, in this plot here, but we also tested ModNet just to see. And uh, so the result can be improved uh, again with the denoiser on ModNet, but ModNet in the beginning was starting from something already very good. So the improvement is kind of marginal in the, in the end, okay? Because in the end, the feature selection was already doing a very good job even with only the experimental data. But still, I mean, you can get a little something with uh, the, this denoising approach. Okay, so I think that was that I finished with uh, uh, my lecture. Um, so basically the take home message is that we have proposed a method to deal with small data sets. And then we have also proposed this method that allows you to take full advantage of all the data that you have of different quality. And I think that in the framework of Nomad where we have data that are coming from, uh, you know, very different sources, uh, you know, we have uh, even unconverged calculations. Sometimes these data can also be useful to, you know, to help you learn about the underlying physics. And so we do this uh, by an appropriate combination of all the data, as I was mentioning, and this the noising procedure, which is something that uh, we tested here for the first time. And, and you've seen that the, the procedure that we've tested for the denoising with the threshold is very simple. There are different approaches to denoising the data that could be tested, but we haven't done so. So I think that with that, you've seen that both approaches uh, provide us a way to improve the results by, you know, when we have limited data and when we have different quality of the data. And I think that this is really how we have to live with in, in data science. We gonna always have different kind of, of quality of the data because we know that you know, getting experiments takes much more time than doing different kinds of DFT calculation. And even within DFT, we know that we have the DFT and then we have higher accuracy that take more time. And as a result, we have low, uh, less data of high quality compared to uh, the low quality ones. And so with that, I thank you uh, for your attention. There's going to be a tutorial uh, available uh, about ModNet that's available on the machine. In principle, there are three different uh, tests that you can make. And I'm going to be available for both questions about the talk and about Monday. Thank you, Jamaka.